Yo, welcome. Welcome to another uh, a podcast. I don't think we've done one before, have we? No, we haven't. This is our first one. You've done mine, but yes. I have not done yours. Very so crazy that we haven't done this yet, man. Um, long awaited. Yeah, this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time, especially after our most recent trip. Um, Perfect timing. Dude, I, I can't say enough as a compliment to to you. Um, of the people I know who really uh, exude that, like, um, monk and motherfucker is what I've been <laughs> calling it. You know, that, like, still have the awareness piece and handle stuff, but are also a complete savage. Thanks. Like, I appreciate that about you so much, man. Um, Thank you. You have an ability it. to stay positive and with childlike excitement in all the best ways possible well thank you that's an awesome so, compliment um that's I'm an honored, awesome compliment honored to especially call you a friend and a brother man hey thank you thank you for that um no i think i think it comes down to i just made a thank you video because we partnered with uh i think it's the largest youtube subscribers uh yeah. that's out there uh, boho beautiful mark okay. and juliana they're awesome. They have 2.2 million subscribers wow. there and like over 200,000 on their email. Anyways, they're, they're, they're big, but one was a professional musician. The other was a professional like gymnast. And um, uh, basically they left that. They left that behind to go um, pursue yoga, which didn't seem to make sense to anybody. Um, Never does. And yeah, yeah. Uh, but Together, anyways, I just looked at the website right before we jumped on, and we have 1,233 new donors. We've raised over $43,000 uh, already. We set the goal at 20. We then reset it at 40, and we've blown through that. Um, so you know the people that it's going to impact. And do, this I all kind of started. And that's yeah. one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show. And like, please share whatever links those are. That way, the audience here can make sure they donate to the same place. Yeah, and if people are hearing beeping right now, I don't know if they are. If you I hope are, it's a but microwave. It's a, I don't think it's a microwave. I think it's a car outside, like oh, doing well. some, some work. But anyways, the link is the Karma Project dot life. So www.thekarmaproject.life. It's hosted on Fight for the Free Island's website, but that's the direct link, or they can go to fightforthefreeisland.org, go to give, and it's the first thing on there, the Karma Project. But no, I'm just blown away because um, they've used their platform to to make a difference, to make an impact, and they're helping the people we love so much. But I was talking with them, and I made a quick video right before getting on here. And I remember this quote, and it was, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Mm. I know you're kind of that guy, not dead yet. What would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? But I've kind of reinterpreted that or interpreted that in my own way of saying, you know, what impact would you make if you only knew you could? So what would, if you could, you know, what impact would you make if you only knew you could? And this project now is that for Fight for the Forgotten. Man, it's that's that so for me personally. Let, yeah. Let's catch people up to speed who don't know you. Uh, sure. Do your whole background spiel of how we got here. And then we can dive yeah. into talking about our most recent trip to Uganda. Sure. I'd love that. So for me, I, a professional mixed martial artist. Um, UFC veteran, Bellator, MMA veteran. Um, so I fought in the top leagues in the world. I uh, was on the reality TV show, The Ultimate Fighter. Um, and I got into MMA because it was my childhood dream. But the reason it, become, it became my childhood dream, I don't think I've ever worded it this way, was because I was kind of a, these living nightmare moments happened. You know, some people wake up in their, in their underwear uh, in front of their school or classmates whenever they're in middle school. Um, I had moments like that actually happen where people stole my underwear and clothes and threw it under the bleachers during the middle school volleyball game. And I'm the chubby kid that's fat and naked trying to cover myself. And, um, but no, I, I remember going to my middle school crush's birthday party and biggest crush I ever had from middle elementary, middle school, high school, and was just infatuated and, uh, really like wanted to catch her eye. And so there was a costume party. It was uh, a costume contest. Winner was going to get a prize. The prize was a Dr. Pepper gumball machine or Whoa. flavored Dr. Pepper gumballs. And her dad worked at Dr. Pepper and uh, the house was decorated as Dr. Pepper. And I knew she loved Transformers. So 
um, like they had a Dr. Pepper machine in their house. They had a Dr. Pepper sign, oh, like weird. vintage sign, all this stuff. Yeah. It's a Texas kind of culture. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Um, but me being a fat kid, I loved it and uh, yeah, love Dr. Pepper. Like it. It's like, yeah, that me too. And so um, I haven't drank one in years, I think. Yeah, but. it would kill me. I've had to eliminate them from my life. I'm controlling <laughs> yeah. that way. Yeah. So I knew she loved Transformers. So I thought what would be really cool was it was around Super Bowl time. I walk into a grocery store. They have the different, you know, setups and they're advertising Dr. Pepper through this guy in a three point stance and another guy in the Heisman that's in Dr. Pepper cardboard boxes, right? Like uh, they have the setup or displays and stuff. So that gave me the idea. Oh, I'm going to transform into Dr. Optimus Pepper, you know, like Optimus Prime, but Dr. Optimus Pepper. Oh, I, I get it. Uh, yeah. So this is ambitious, 24. by the way. For yeah. Me yeah. It, it, you, you're right. So I really wanted to catch her eye. <laughs> my mom, my mom helped me with kids in the country with some duct tape. We can get a lot of stuff done. So, uh, especially with mama's help. So I've had a 24 pack on the head, 12 packs on the arms, like a chest plate, a shield, a sword. And I went to the party and when the door opened, I remember I walked in, her grandma said, Jennifer's going to love this. And then I go in, in the living room was a Dublin Dr. Pepper machine, which is like this kind of, you think of Mexican Coke, the cane, real cane okay. sugar. It's, it's that Dublin Dr. Pepper. So it comes from Dublin, Texas. I think they're out of business now, but uh, I push the button. It pops out. I go to the backyard uh, feeling like I'm going to win this costume contest. I'm going to get the Dr. Pepper gumball machine. And when the door opens, I'm hit with a bunch of flashes of light. It's cameras. My eyes are adjusting while I hear the sound of laughter. And um, then I see my middle school crush and she crushed me by saying, I can't believe you thought you were good enough to come to my party. A guy named Tyler. He has a cool transformation story now helps like inner city youth and stuff. But at that time he was, a punk and he said you're worthless and then the guy that organized um the whole thing who was my notorious middle school bully but started in third grade now it's eighth grade he said you should just kill yourself jesus christ so, yeah at uh 13 years old i started the biggest battle of my life which is mostly mental health stuff uh related which at that time was depression uh was clinically diagnosed with depression after that um and, you know, at 13, you believe the things people say about you. So I felt like I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. Maybe I should just kill myself. So I started battling suicidal ideation, which turned into two suicide attempts, which uh, then became addiction. And so, yeah, it was kind of a cycle. But a month after that, I ran away from that party, by the way, ended up behind a Dairy Queen, threw away all that stuff. Uh, one of our buddies, Aaron Alexander, on his podcast, he helped me more than maybe most therapists have ever. He's like, is that why you don't like having sticky hands? And I'm like, Oh, Oh shit. Oh my like, God. Yeah. So I pull off the cardboard, I throw it away in the dumpster, but there's like, uh, I don't know, chili and, and, and Jeez. blizzards and all this stuff inside the dumpster. Right. That's rotting and there's flies. And so I remember just holding myself and not the fetal position, but I'm sitting there almost like the movies. You see people shaking, rocking. Like that's the first time I ever remember doing that. And my mom had to come find me because there weren't cell phones at that time. And so the employees come out after closing and throwing away shit and they're like, Oh honey, what's going on? And uh, yeah, I, I just, that's when my parents knew I was getting bullied. I was like hiding it from them. They knew of one other instance in front of the whole school, but um, yeah, I mean, my pictures are being, I played a uh, hooky or whatever, like I'm sick. Um, but you know, it's cause they were passing around that picture, uh, around school and stuff. And so, um, which uh, I should have owned it. I should, if I had some self-confidence, I could have gone back and go, yeah, that was a dope costume. But instead it was like the most embarrassing it's too much, of my dude. life. It's too much yeah. at that age, especially once you're yeah. already not on the end. Yeah. So I, I guess the reason I share that story is I've had to overcome a lot when it comes to self-worth or bullying or other things. And it's set up my life now to where if that didn't happen a month later, I found the UFC. I found the VHS tapes and I was at a, it's called Trader's Village. It's like a flea market. I walked into a store because they were selling flying squirrels and iguanas and other things. 
but they had used VHS tapes in the same store. And so I found UFC 2 through 11 or 2 through 9, something like that, where he's missing number one. And uh, when I watched that, I decided, well, if I could transform into one of these guys, you know, they don't get bullied. Um, and uh, maybe they'd be invited to the party. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'd be an, uh, a post-fight victory and it'd be an after party for them. Um, so I just wanted to become someone completely different than myself. And then I fell in love with the martial art, uh, martial arts. Like it's, uh, loved, loved that aspect, human chess match. And so from there, it started a martial arts journey, became a national champion uh, a couple times, a state champion 10 times, an all American five times. And I went out of high school to the Olympic training center. Um, but I got my arm broke. And then the addiction started. So I was wrestling against an Olympic bronze medalist, a world champion, and just a freak accident, snapped my arm, broke it, dislocated it. They told me I had a 30% chance to ever compete again. Oh. So I went to Iowa State after that, had a full ride from a guy named Cale Sanderson and wrestled with him. And he told me, stay active. Well, I jump started my MMA career. UFC was looking at me. And I got invited on the Ultimate Fighter. They were looking at me for pay per views. Then the the show came about, and that jump started my career. I was already fighting, but um, jump started the career, fame, all this stuff happened. But I was hiding an oxycotton addiction because I had elbow surgery, and so I'm winning how fights. Long post, I I built... How long post uh, surgery had you been? When I started the addiction, or like how long had or... you still been using? Uh, the whole time. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, since, um, since. I built a, th- yeah, <laughs> a 13 and two career as an oxy addict and, uh, and ad- addict to all sorts of other stuff too. But um, no, I would say how we get to Uganda and we could talk the other stuff too is um, I was getting my hand raised and I would think, is this it? Is this all like, um, you know, I could be in a crowd, whether it was an arena that sometimes would chant my name after a fight and, or I could be at an after party where people are so excited to come take a picture or I could be in a grocery store and the guys making the rotisserie chicken are like coming out to take my picture or picture with me. And I don't know. I just felt so alone, like, uh, alone in my struggle of addiction or depression or whatever. And so I started, I got kicked off my fight team um, because of addiction. And it was like 34 to one, I think uh, was the Just vote. being a problem. Yeah. Not necessarily a problem to them, but not showing up. Right. That's, that's really, and, what I mean, right. Like, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you too well to think, and look, I guess I don't know you during those years, right? Yeah. So yeah. I don't, well, I don't want to think anything, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't think I was causing problems, but I, I wasn't, I was, I was there for my stuff, but not there for their stuff. And, mm. um, that's selfish behavior. So, um, and I would disappear and I'd go hitchhiking in the mountains of Colorado from drug house to drug house. Um, and which is dark days. So, it's a bit sketchy. um, yeah, yeah. And, um, I, Got kicked off the fight team. I was training for the main event at the Hard Rock in Vegas, the casino. And I was training with a high school wrestling team because nobody would take me, basically. <laughs> and uh, Fuck. and it was a wake-up call. Um, I won the fight, but it was a decision, which was one of my first or only well, – the only win that was a decision. I had two losses by decision. And the reason it was a decision, I was about to finish them in the first round – but then all of a sudden I had to cover my mouth um, because if you throw up in a fight, they, they, uh, it's a DQ. You're disqualified. Okay. So um, you can't throw up in between rounds. You can't throw up. Really? In the fight. Is that you a fucking, yeah. is that rule across the board? Like UFC yeah, yeah. still? Yep. Yep. Of course. Oh, and, weird. Uh, yeah. So um, I mean, I would have thought you could pee between fluid. rounds if need be. No, no, you can't. Pee shit or throw up. I can know? bleed um, everywhere. Yeah, I can bleed everywhere, but you can't do any of those other things. Got it. And so I was starting to throw up and and um I had to cover my mouth and swallow my own vomit. 
Um, and so oh, terrible. No. Yeah. So, uh, people are wondering why I'm stopping ground and pound and why am I just burying my face in my hand and, and stuff. And, um, the opponent tried to protest, uh, in between rounds and, um, and, uh, cause he knew it was happening. <laughs> um, and, uh, <clears throat> then I had to fight the next two rounds. I mean, were you puking and, uh, due to the addiction or were you puking due to... I was puking because I found out after the fight, I had uh, stomach ulcers um, okay. from from what I was using. And um, so all this shit was happening and I just decided like, you know what, I'm going to take a break from fighting. I'm going to go on a little soul wander or journey uh, or vision, vision quest or something. And uh, that got me into, I, I decided I want to get outside of myself. So what can I do? And um, I, I, I think I said before, like I never really did anything, but really I actually volunteered at like the Special Olympics when I was in school. And my mom's best friend, her son had Down syndrome and I love them. And uh, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to get involved with something. Started with a polar plunge for kids with Down syndrome, uh, got in the cold and raised some money. Then it was a kid got in a car or not a car accident, an ATV accident, had a traumatic brain injury. He was a, a fan, his dad said at least, and of me on the Ultimate Fighter. So I went and visited him and I was wrecked. I left there crying because here's a kid that's in terrible pain. Uh, I'm supposed to be encouraging him. He doesn't even know I'm there. I'm taking pictures with him bedside while he's like moaning in anguish and pain. And his dad and family so excited I'm there or whatever. But like, I was like, did that even matter? Um, right. And I guess it did, but... Um, what I, I mean you... was like, yeah, then it was just this like moment where it's like, well, what, what can I do? And I got a call from one of the staff. I forget who it was at the hospital, but saying, you know, would you want to come back and volunteer? And so I became an official volunteer, mostly at night with kids that had cancer and pushing them around um, or like in the evening, um, you know, when people are off work, I'd go up there and I'd see a lot of the family, see a lot of the kids. Um ended up organizing like a visit of all these badass UFC fighters that had world championship belts and my coach on the ultimate fighter Rashad Evans and other guys. And, um, and it really made an impact, uh, on the kids, but also on the fighters. Mm. And, um, so then it was the Denver rescue mission and then it was an inner city youth group. And then it was like kids at risk. And then, uh, then there was a wild moment, 10 months over, uh, trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do with my life. And, uh, at this time in my life, I hadn't really prayed. And, uh, but I think I was just searching for answers, hungry to hear something. That's all I can explain it as. And I just said, okay, God, um, you know, what do you want me to do with my life? And, uh, wasn't expecting clouds to part or to hear anything. <laughs> um, but I wanted to hear something. Uh, and all I can say is like, I've, I've done a lot of psychedelics. I've done a lot of psychedelic sense. Nothing in my life ever compares to this, how vivid of a vision I had, how real it was to me. It was like waking up from a dream thinking it actually happened. Um, and I saw myself in a rainforest and I was walking down a footpath and I was clearing vines and thickets out of the way. And then I heard drumming and then I heard singing, a very distinct singing. And then I came into a clearing and I saw twig and leaf huts and I met a man, didn't, we didn't talk or communicate, but it was like, uh, I saw his ribs. He was coughing. I knew that he was sick, hungry, thirsty, poor, oppressed. And I knew he was enslaved that he called someone else master. And in that vision, I had this word that came to me, which was forgotten. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper, forgotten, hungry, thirsty, poor, sick, oppressed, uh, enslaved. And I cried. I cried more than I've ever cried. Uh, yeah, especially still. from an arbitrary dream, right? That like, right. Yeah. You know, yeah, just simply and, and, uh, whatever you want to call it, right? Like the source tuning in, whatever it is yeah. hit you. Yeah. It hit me. And I, I cried more than I've ever cried at a funeral. I cried more than I ever cried after heartbreak. And I left a little puddle of tears on the ground, um, uh, at least bigger than a silver dollar. And um, 
uh, I was like, what is going on? And the tears um, were in the perfect shape of Uganda. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, it was, I, I, I should, I don't, I don't know what it was in the Just shape add of, that. but it was, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> but I, I make it more eloquent, but I, I, I was like, what is going on with me? Am I crazy? Is that a psychedelic reactivation? Is that a psychotic episode? Am, am I, am I knucking futs? Yeah. And, uh, and I didn't think I could ever tell anybody. So for three days I didn't. And then all of a sudden I meet this guy named Caleb. Why don't you meet him someday? Uh, and he was buddies with Bear Grylls. He had done survival training with them. He had how'd you meet, set up how'd you run stuff. into this guy? Just through UFC so, shit? No. Um, I went to like this event and he was speaking at it. And um, then uh, he shared a story. And his story was about uh, he had spent time with the Vanuatu tribe that invented bungee jumping. He lived with the Maasai tribe that hunted Oh, that's lions. right. So these are the guys um, that jump off of the pier. Yeah. Like face first with in vines. the dirt with vines. Yeah, with vines. They're, and if it's they, less bungee jumping, more static line, yeah, right? Like they don't give much. more. More like rite of passage where uh, if you don't hit your head, you're a coward and you're cursed. If you hit your head and you die, you are cursed. If you kiss the dirt, which is a, their yam harvest, so it's above after they plant, I think, um, that they kiss their forehead on the dirt. People can YouTube this, Vanuatu bungee jumping. And yeah, you're right. It's just a vine, two vines around their ankles. Well, and no, like, no Man, I have so stretched. many questions about the mechanics of this, of like, yeah. How often do I, I have they, to do it to I stay think blessed? They, I, think, I think they only do. Is it this once. like a one time? Like I nail it on the first <laughs> I, jump and like just kiss uh, the ground perfectly and be like, "I'm good." Hopefully, but if you, if you if you Google image search this thing, you're like, "Oh, that guy's not going to stop." No, He's it's just crazy. Hit. I, I've I've yeah. seen the videos of that stuff. That stuff's wild. And the same with what uh, you were saying. The what the Zulu the Maasai Maasai uh, sorry. Maasai hunting lions in Kenya and Tanzania. They're on the border, or they're in both countries, and. Um, so I think from the Maasai Mara to the Serengeti <clears throat> and um, yeah. So I am like, okay, if there's one dude I can tell this to, it's this, this crazy man. <laughs> and so, yeah, right. Right. Um, he's been over there. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, well, and I didn't know where it was. I was very like illiterate with geography. Look, I knew man. it was the rainforest. And so I was like rainforest, Amazon, but these people had dark skin, like dark, dark skin. Um, and then I'm like, uh, I'm like, Thailand, they have elephants. No, it's not, it's not there. Not India, not China. You know, where is this place? Oh, did you see who elephants are these in people? the vision? Uh, no, but I okay. just ran uh, big gotcha, rainforest. Gotcha, so, gotcha. Yeah, I don't know why I brought up elephants, uh, except for you just saw them. I just saw them. They're cute. <laughs> and so um, I decided to tell this guy. I actually got in the vehicle with my friends and we were, the vehicle turned on. And that's when I'm like, if I don't tell this guy, I'm going to regret it. And so I tell him, wait, I got to go tell this guy, uh, get his number, give him mine. So were you and just so, attending this or were you like invited? Yeah, I was like, just attending it. I was just attending okay, it. Okay, so you're just now running up to this fucking guy's car as he's yeah. trying to leave. Yeah, yeah, actually. Okay, great. Um, and Let me so tell you about actually, my I dream. Inside, <laughs> yeah, I go inside. I wait till he's finished with everybody. And I'm like, hey, man, uh, can I have your number? Can I give you mine? I just have a story for you. He's like, you have something to tell me? Go ahead. And I'm like, all right. Uh, uh, I'm like, well, it's going to sound crazy. He goes, I'm here for it. And so I, I tell him the vision. And by the end of it, he's kind of got a little grin. And I go, what? He said, I know who they are. And I said, what? He goes, they're the Mabuti Pygmy people or the part of the Pygmy tribe. They are in the Congo Basin rainforest. I'm like, who, where? And he says, no, you said forgotten. Um, th this is them. And I said, well, how do you know? And he goes, because I'm supposed to go in three and a half weeks. I'm supposed to meet him. And I said, what? And he said, um, he goes, look, but three days ago when you had this vision, my team called. I was taking three other guys. They've all canceled their trip. The U.S. State Department says don't go for any reason. I think the rebels had just taken over the airport. There's no way in. Um, and uh, he said they're literally killing people, literally beheading. They're cannibalizing the pygmies. Um, it's not good. And uh, I'm like, it doesn't sound good. Why are you going? He goes, well, my wife asked me yesterday. 
to cancel my trip unless I get a sign. <laughs> he goes, come get in my truck. Come tell my wife. And so I get in his truck inside my friend's car, I drive across town. We go into their house. She's pregnant and she has uh, like a toddler. Okay. I'm supposed to tell this woman this. Perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. So I tell her and she looks at Caleb and she goes, you got to take this guy. <clears throat> and I'm like, whoa. I'm like, do we have to go now? Can we postpone? Can we delay? Can we like wait till it kind of. Oh, amazing. It's amazing how that pops up in us, right? Yo, yeah, yeah. That, like, I literally was oh, trying shit, to come up with man, that excuse. opportunity just landed in your lap. And your immediately first thoughts are. How do I get out of this? Not yet. Like yeah, I, not yet. I, I, I'm not yet. I can't. Yeah, I can't yet. But meanwhile, yeah. Instead of not dead yet, it's not yet. Not yet. Yeah, yeah. Skip the dead. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, I might be if I go. And so, um, uh, I, I tell Caleb, and I try, I'm asking these questions, and him and his wife Jess are like, "If you don't go, you'll never know. You always wonder what if, what coulda, shoulda, woulda happened." And I'm like, "Whoa!" So that kind of sunk in, and I'm like, "Well, let me think about it." Um, I go back and I had done one trip to Haiti. And when I was there, we crossed from the Dominican Republic in this bus. And when we went across, it was flooded. And so when we get to immigration, they pull my passport open, which was under the bus and it's soaked. So whenever they pull it, uh, my face comes off the passport, basically like at least half of it. And so I even tell him I have an excuse. I have an excuse. My passport, it's not valid. Sure, um, yeah. You know, and so uh, they're like, well, go, go find a passport place. So you can what get year expedited. is this? 2011. Okay. August. Um, 12 and years so, ago. yeah, 12 years ago. Wow. So I get to Denver. I Google search passport. I go to the closest place to me. I go inside. Um, the late, I, late uh, first off, it was weird because there was like airport security to go get your passport. Like there was like armed guys there. And I'm like, what is this place? And I get in, talk to the lady. She goes, well, what do you need it fast for? I said, I don't know. I'm supposed to go see if there's a way, like it's I'm a scout trip. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to Africa to see if I can help some people. And so I all of a sudden say, well, she goes, go across the hall, get your picture, um, and bring back the passport photos. So I do, I come back. She says, sit right there. And she comes out 30 minutes later and hands me a warm passport Whoa. and says, says, I think, I think you're supposed to go on this trip. Like whatever you're doing, like go. <laughs> and I'm like, God damn it, man. I'm, I'm like, what? Son of so, a bitch universe. Yeah. Right. So then I make a, f I wait a few days. I call him. I go, man, this is kind of crazy. He goes, you don't think that's a sign? And um, so then I make a Facebook post or something that I'm thinking about going on this trip. This is who they are. This is where I'm going. Um, and uh, the I, my last fight or the fight before, um, he reaches out and says, hey, I talked to my wife. I, by the way, I knocked this dude out. And he says, hey, me and my wife want to pay for your plane trip. Uh, we want to buy your ticket. So round trip. Okay. I'm like, I'm like, what? So I end up going, we take uh, my buddy Colin, we take all these, you know how the planes are to get there. Yep. So, so MAF that flew us into Uganda, we just walk up to their front door, knock same, same, same exact airport you were at. Oh really? And, and um, in, in, in Tibet, well, or yeah. Uh, in, in Kijansi. Oh, so in Kijansi. Got um, it. Yeah. Like their headquarters. So, which only has a few planes, right? <laughs> and it's a dirt runway. Right. Air uh, it's it's an airport. Like, yeah. We're like, <laughs> hey, we know no one's flying into Congo right now, but will you guys take us? And um, they're Did like- you got parachutes? <laughs> yeah. They're like, sure. We've got to find a different airport and a landing strip, <laughs> right. but we'll, we'll call some people. So, we go and th they decide to take us the next day. And they call ahead. They find an airstrip. We're supposed to be there at a certain time. You know how time works there. Um, yeah. So uh, we're we're on time, but the runway that we're trying to land on isn't on time. And what I mean by that is whenever we're trying to land, we have to buzz it and then circle it. And all these people run out of their huts with machetes 
to clear the runway. So like the soldier guys, um, like we saw in um, Fort Portal or? Fort Portal, uh, similar. It's like the, yeah, so there was a barracks, but there was also um, just people that were helping clear okay. the runway because they were already supposed to have it cleared, yet they don't know when the last time a plane actually landed there. Sure. So so the grass is tall. Um, we land, we drop the the ladder. The ladder's in this huge ant pile that the like, ants are crawling all over us. Um and like, that's my introduction. And, uh, we get out, we drive, we stay in a, a quote unquote motel. Um, quote unquote I wake, motel. Okay. Yeah. I wake up in the morning to like a uh, light hitting my face while well, I look in the walls, like there's bullet holes in this place. Um, and I'm like, where am I? What are we doing? Why are we here? So that's like your um, first real moment of how fucking far from home you are. Oh Yeah. Oh yeah. No, no cell service. Um, we hadn't got any SIM cards or anything like that. Um, and it's like, what are we doing? I'm mean, like, I guess I'm to go. Yeah. I, go, I, go, I can't I imagine I'm... the lack of infrastructure comparatively to what I saw. Yeah. Well, we're, we're deep in the rainforest. Of, well, getting, we're on the edge of the rainforest in Congo and there's, there's no electricity, no running water, no, no anything. Um, so we get in a truck again, we drive, we get out and we jump on motorcycles through the rainforest for about two hours, hour and a half, maybe. Where'd y'all have um, car motorcycles? Uh, just the local guys that have oh, so, like so we're on these things called, uh, well, no, I wasn't driving it. I was on the back. Okay. So just boat to boat us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But guys that were willing to go through the rainforest. Um, so, uh, like we're on dirt trails, um, and then we, uh, I mean, like we're, we're dodging bushes or like, like vines and things while we're driving. And so then we get out and we're on the edge of a river. It was the Turi river. And we've got to cross that in a canoe. Um, and so it's like a, it's a dugout piece of a log. And so we're going across this. We have to aim way left to aim end way right because it's a rushing river it's connected to the congo river the deepest most powerful river in the world we know that there's crocodiles and hippos all yeah. sorts of stuff so um we get across we hike for 30 minutes maybe and we're clearing vines and thickets out of the way we hear drumming then we hear singing and we come into a clearing first guy we meet you can see all his ribs and he's coughing and he's got tuberculosis and i have to take a knee because I'm weak in the knees because I'm overwhelmed. This is the vision, not kind of like the vision. It is the vision. So it's the wildest deja vu thing you can experience. And, uh, or that I had, and I take a knee and Caleb and Colin are like grabbing my trap saying, this is your vision. This is your vision. I have the vision written down on my, in my backpack, in my journal. I'm like, what? Like this stuff happens, can happen. Does it happen? Like it was the most surreal moment of my life. Uh, still to this day. And um, uh, we stay for a couple weeks. We meet the people. We get to know them. Their slave masters are coming to us saying, hey, what are you doing with these people? These are my property. I own these people. All sorts of wild stuff. They don't have clean water. They're slaves. They uh, have HIV. They have malaria. They have one or more disease. They don't have food. They... Um, you know, it, it was just overwhelming, 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 overwhelming. And uh, one of the last days, Kale and Colin are like, what are you going to do? I'm like, what are you talking about? What am I going like, to do? Uh, yeah. What are, you, what are, you, what are we going to do? I barely just got do? here. Yeah. And, uh, and honestly, man, it was the most defeating moment of my life. Like, this problem is way too big. I'm way too small. Like, I felt crushed under the weight because, like, something – really special happened but like yeah there's nothing that can be done the the visual i got was trying to empty the ocean with an eyedropper and it's like what is it going to do if what an overwhelming I my task, entire life? right like how how is yeah. one man supposed Who's, to fix this problem that's gone on for millennia yeah and i knew it wasn't it could never ever be just on me but like um yeah like thinking that and caleb said something that and he goes dude every every drop is like a human heart like that's a life um 
And I'm like, whoa, okay, that's true. Because I was saying stuff like, who would ever notice? Would I notice? Would they notice? Like, would it actually do anything? Um, and we said every drop is a human heart. I was just like, whoa. Dude, like, so that that's something that hit me on this trip really, really loud when I, when I was with you. Um, I would say I've often felt that way regarding charity or whatever type of organization work, right? That like, oh, the problem is yeah. too big. Like, what can I do to help or any of this? Or like, what good's me donating $25 or any yeah. of this type of thing? And then actually being over there and seeing that, yes, solving the giant problem of all the Batwa having yeah. clean water houses and all of that is gigantic and overwhelming. Yeah. But I can change that person's life. Yeah. And that's still a huge impact. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And being able to look like, at it from that perspective instead of the big picture of like, well, what's still happening? Yeah. And, and I've been work, trying to rework a little bit the mission and vision of Fight for the Forgotten. Um, the vision is always going to be the same, but the mission might adapt because it has. You know, at first we started with water, mm -hmm. but oh, we've always done land before that. And so as we got going and as we got started, um, you know, it's evolved and grown and changed as the needs keep coming up. Um, but it, it's, I think at the end of the mission statement, we're going to say something to the effect of um, because the world's or at least Africa's most oppressed and poor people deserve a fighting chance. You know, like we're not trying to take these hunter gatherers who have all these obstacles we're not trying to, to propel them, like, like uh, launch pad them into the first world. It's like, no, we're trying to give them a fighting chance just to be on this uh, even playing field or playing ground as their neighbors. Well, I mean, honestly, like, to survive. I, yeah. I mean, it, that idea that they're forgotten, right? Like if they're forgotten yeah. people and they're not supported and they're not giving resources and they don't have any of this, they'll eventually die off and go extinct. Yeah. It, well, an endangered people group, like a real one. And the the thing about it, like going back to that that first trip, I didn't promise land, water, food. The only thing I could promise, I asked Caleb, like if, to that question, like what are you going to do? I'm like, dude, I need another sign of some sort. He goes, what are you talking about? How can you ever ask for another sign? And I'm like, I don't know. Just give me something. I don't know I can what to do, do is the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Like something tangible. I'm a fighter. You think right. I, I wrestle dudes. Well? Yeah. <laughs> Um, you think I know how to fundraise? You think I know how to buy land in another? You got country? anyone over here I can wrestle I, for a well? I will. I'll yeah. be their fucking champion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like I've I've never bought land for myself. How do I buy right. land for a people group? Um, and uh, never farmed. I go to the grocery store. Uh, and so, like, um, so the chief pulled us to the side and he gave me that sign or something tangible I could do. It was hey, everyone else calls us the forest people. We call ourselves the forgotten. So I still have that piece of paper that says forgotten. So ding, ding, ding. Like here it is. Oh, that's heavy. And he goes, we don't have a voice. Can you help us have one? And he looked right at me and motioned at me with his hand. Can you help us have one? And I was just like, whoa, like I can tell your story. I'm a, an American that has free speech. So we all have a voice. Um, and so, yes, um, I can do that one thing. And then from telling the story started coming funds and other opportunities and ways to like formalize a 501c3. And it turned from a passion project to a real nonprofit. And, um, and we've got like an A team of like, I was just talking with Zoe, you know, Zoe, she like, she seems like a spy with five passports or whatever, she's but great. she's, I can't, I can't wait to have her badass. on the show. Zoe's such oh, a dude, G. It's going to be awesome. She's a G. And so like, uh, being able to like, just say, you know what, this happened for a reason. Um, and then water came from a, a, a story uh, that happened of a young man named Andy Bo, one and a half years old, young boy, um, you know, was holding him when he took his last breath and uh, at least holding the cup in the back of his head and holding his little hand. And um, blood came out of his ears. And I was just like, what is, what happened? And what happened was, he was, his mom was denied hospital treatment not once but twice just because of her tribe. Um, I was told you're too dirty to come in here. Second time I was told we won't waste our medicine on a pygmy animal. Um, and then like Slave Master said it was cheaper to bury him than to keep him alive. 
and I was holding a $6 shovel and the pills were a dollar. The shot was $3. Um, and so I was like, well, that's not true. And so I did the only thing I knew I could, which I was big and strong and they were mourning. So I got to digging the grave where they told me to do it. And uh, then it's like, okay, so we need land, we need water, we need food. Um, and that's turned into housing now and is going to turn into a hospital and a school, um, which is always putting the proposal together now on how to fundraise for that. And um, yeah, it's been 82 water wells. It's been 32 family homes. It's been over 3,000 acres of land. It's four farms and, uh, and it's latrines and hand washing stations. And it would provided clean water to over 50,000 people, um, which are the Pygmy people, the Mabuti and the Batwa and their neighbors. So that it's a, it's benefiting the entire community, not just one side, which would end up causing whether it's resentment or jealousy conflict, or for sure. conflict. Yeah. So it's, yeah, a, it's what a an interesting building. way to, to bring them forward, to be part of the yeah. local community because they now have the resource to share and I think yeah. it's really interesting from the spirit of the Batwa, you know, that they don't have the feeling of fuck them. No, oh, no, you're right. Yeah, we're not sharing with these people. Fuck them. Yeah. Which, yeah, man, I would have a tough have. time. They could have, but they don't have. They don't. They just, they have it as gratitude that, oh my gosh, this thing that's helping us is going to help them too. This is awesome. Or This is a win-win. Like so much so to where... I don't know that this is based in fear. I think it's really based in generosity, but at the same time, they know intuitively like to ask the questions like, Hey, Hey, you're doing this for us, but can you also do it for them? Like, uh, which is pretty spectacular or big of them. Right. It's like, a mature... you don't think any of that's based on like, if we don't, there'll be problems or are they worried that if they get think, houses think... and they get land and they get running water, I think it's both. Okay. I think, I think, uh, I think 80, 90% of it is like, they just got awesome hearts and they're, they're incredible people. Man. I, and then I think part getting of Getting to is, go blew me away. Yeah. yeah. It blew me away to see that, man. I had. Well, what'd you think? You, you, you had a two month. I mean, I remember, I remember the, I remember one big moment, not just the water walk, but the, like we did it reverse with Amy. So my partner and significant other who I want to marry, uh, she, um, we took her to the old land first. Okay. So, to, to, so, uh, so that Boonie Masori. Yeah. The, uh, the slum that they were in 2007, they were evicted from the rainforest, put behind the slum, less than an acre of land and 300 people were put to live there. Well, they dwindled down to half their population. Yeah. In 20 and 17. So yeah. Yeah. So um, and let me paint that picture for other people now that sure. I got to experience it. Right. Yeah. Which you started on the new land. Oh, man. This is, this is a group of people, right. That had been living happily in the forest as hunter gatherers yep. up until this time in 2007, 2008. Yep. Whenever they were told um, for the, for sustainability of the forest, the most sustainable people have to be evicted. Or for well, because we're turning the forest into animals. a tourist thing that makes money. Yep, yep. That's and that's what we're of doing. Endangered species; these endangered people have no more rights. Is it, it's because the local government can't figure out how to make any money off of them? Yeah. Um. So they get kicked out to. of the forest, right? As total hunter gatherers, and you know this in the forest, they've got room. Yeah, and, well, yeah. And spread out, and it's their it's their playground, and they're the protectors of the forest and the people of the forest. Seeing this area in the man trying to paint the accurate picture of saying like, Oh, it's behind the slums. Like for anybody in the Western world, all of Boondi Missouri looks like slums. Oh yeah. Like yeah, there isn't sure. running water in town. There isn't right. electricity. There's not like trash pickup. Like there isn't anyone to call for services, right? Like if there's a fucking yeah. fire or an emergency, like no one's coming. Oh, it's just all, it's just all going down. Yeah. Forget um, it. paint the picture. Yeah. It, man, just crazy to me. Right. That like, there's, there's no resource there. Right. And then. So yeah, people battling for resources that don't have any. And they don't, no one has any. all of them. No one. Right. No one has any, the locals don't. And these people now, the Batois have been moved to this half acre 
behind the slums that raw sewage runs through that they have to bury all their dead on, which now is 150 people over 20 years. Yep. Um, living 150 in graves on that, on that living in water, uh, mud brick huts with a cloth door. Yep. And so I assume on the slums, they would that some are still doing 10 to 20, 10 to 20 uh, people per little bit. I would assume as many people that can fit inside of there are sleeping yep. in there. They would, they would sleep shoulder to shoulder of and foot to, foot to head. Like uh, yeah. basically like people are sleeping above them and below them. And beside it'd be them. how you would ship us out in original packaging if you had to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, just like sardines, man. And yeah. there's no door. There's no privacy. There's no safety. Yeah. And so and they would either sleep on banana leaves or palm leaves on the dirt or, and then their door would either be cloth or a rice bag. Yeah. And so talking about safety, right? Like, the locals will end up raping or bloodletting from the pygmies mm -hmm. because well, a witch doctor or some other local holistic medicine person, whatever you want to call it, would explain that sex with a pygmy or drinking the blood of a pygmy would cure HIV. Yep. I mean, they refer to that, to rape and people cutting you to drink your blood as nightly disturbances. Like, that's what the Batwa described it to us, us as, man. Nightly yeah. disturbances. Like, what the yeah. fuck are you talking about? Nightly yeah. disturbances? And not even getting emotional about it, but it is just a way of life. Yeah. That this is what happens sometimes at night. Yeah. And then and then whenever we clarified it, when you say sometimes, I remember I was asking Julius, I go, is this once a year? Is this once a month? And he was like, no, many times a week. And times. I was like, yeah, a couple times. And a I mean, like, several times a man, it's so easy for someone to hear that and wonder why they don't fight back. Like they can't. Yeah, they can't. Because the, because they're just every, everybody would turn against them. Yeah. And, and so there's, again, no recourse for if someone was to murder. No, no, not at all. So, uh, there was times last, my trip before you came, uh, the hospital denied them treatment and they lost someone. Well, the hospital took in the body to basically, you could call it equivalent to a morgue, right? Holding mm. the body. They're holding How the did body it get waiting, there? waiting. Well, they, once they died, then they took them into the hospital and then, and then they wanted a bribe. Oh, so they the, carried um, some body. They carried a, a corpse to the hospital. Yeah. Well, no, they, they, they went there sick. And got they it, were got it, got it, got it. And the, once he was denied, he died. And then they asked to reclaim the body and then they wanted a bribe. Of how much? And so I think it was around hundred dollars, which is impossible which is crazy. Yeah, which, which is, is crazy. You're talking about a group of people that what what you guys said to us. I mean, even these they guys have average money. incomes less than a dollar a day. Yeah, yeah, the neighbors. Um, so they're asking for like three months' pay from from a person that gets paid money, and now they're asking someone that doesn't get paid money for money. And um, so uh, the best I've seen anyone among whether any of the pygmy people, whether it's the Batwa in Uganda or Mabuti, was one guy worked for eight, eight days and he got paid equivalent to 3,700 shillings, which was about a dollar for like eight days work. So someone that actually did get paid, they got a dollar in eight days. Um, so yeah, impossible. <laughs> then, then, so I, I remember, I'll bring this up because you were like, hey, well now they got these big houses uh, and they have wooden beds and mattresses and mosquito nets, but their door is, is steel. Their yeah. windows has, has bars and steel windows. And uh, does it feel like it's a little bit of a prison? Um, and so I was like, I don't know, let's ask them. And then I continued this conversation later with Julius too. And he was just like, now I can go to sleep in peace. Right. Yo, man, it's no. such a perspective. Like I, I, I yeah. never had, right? Like I've never had yeah. danger at night or any of that type of shit. Like yeah. I just don't have that experience to paint that perspective yeah. for me. And we have doors with locks. We have right. alarm systems. We have video cameras. Um, and they had a tattered, torn rice bag door that people came and, through and on a couple and days. People a week. were coming. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I, he he was telling me things like, "Now we're safe." Now we're protected. Once we're inside, nobody can come inside. Yeah. Like their doors have double locks on them, but they're in a much safer area. Plus, uh, the plus they're up in the mountains them. and like nobody's walking up there just for yeah. shits and grins. 
and there's military uh, bases yeah. and or barracks on three sides of the mountain. So um, they're they're safe, protected. They the think of that as like a husband um, <clears throat> knowing your wife's safe at night and she never was, or your child can literally sleep on a on a mattress. They're warm. They're not in the rain, um, and nobody's going to come in and harm you. So, question for you, man. Like I, I know we talked about, and now that you've got to spend what well, shit over you know almost a month back over there. Yeah. Um, I know prior to getting to go back because of COVID and everything else, and you'd been tied up for two years and footage you have is yeah. old and everything else. And you went back through depression and had more substance abuse issues in that two years. And we talked about that a little bit, right? About like that, yeah. not being around your family and people and being able to actually follow your purpose. Yeah. So now going back and spending that month and seeing that progress, you know, where, how do you sit now? Yeah, I do. Um, recharged, re-energized, uh, I feel full. So, um, uh, full of love at least and, and or fulfilled. So, which is awesome. Uh, and I think you getting to see it and help tell the story with Brant, uh, Amy getting to come and meet the people because for, for me, it, you helped me have the realization that it was eating at me. And yeah, uh, of course it is, dude. Yeah. I mean, cause like, for me to be the founder of fight for the forgotten, I can't forget about them and not be there, not be present and help continue to tell the story whenever we have on the horizon, the most impactful projects yet with the most powerful partnerships to make it happen. All we need is the funding. Right. And so uh, I don't want to feel like the bottleneck that it's, it's, it's not happening because of. And you um, felt like that for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that led to the, the relapse and me going to treatment for the first time and then the second time. And, um, but I'm uh, looking back, I'm thankful for it because now I have tools and resources I've never had before. Mm. Uh, training, training and for the biggest fight of my life that I guess like maybe before I was trying to fight something I had no training for. And, uh, and I was a big opponent and, so, and I was just doing it off of willpower and purpose, which is, which is good, but not sufficient whenever you don't have like, now you still have to have tools. Yeah. Tools. So, um, yeah, no, now, now having come back, like I'm fired up to continue to, to fundraise, continue to tell their story, continue to make it happen or help make it happen. It takes a tribe and a village and it takes the donors and it takes the people like Zoe and BTEC and Joffrey and Cosmos and Paul, An incredible and team. all the guys, you know? Yeah. I, well, that's what was so cool. I asked Amy, I go, what were your highlights? And she kind of put two together. She goes, meeting the people now made it real. Like, yeah. um, like I've heard this story. This is such a big part of your life. And so being able to connect the dots and connect with the people, um, was, the absolute highlight, but she goes as equal to that, equal to that was meeting who I, I think I'm, I'm paraphrasing correctly, but it was uh, like one of the most powerful teams she's ever met or known, like bright, brilliant people with like hearts of gold. <laughs> and she goes, wow, meeting them was, was incredible. So um, we're going to do it and we're going to build this hospital. We're going to build a school. And Yo, I have, have no staff. doubt. I have no doubt in, in the world, man. Um, seeing what you've built there and especially like getting the story told how we got to, you know, I mean, we show up in, in Karambi land um, where all the houses and everything have been built. And it's really hard for me to get the perspective immediately that like, Oh shit, they've only been here for six months. Yeah. Like that's yeah, right. so new. Yeah. So new, so new. And, and for the way that they went on to the land. It had to be their decision. I don't know. I don't know if BTEC shared the story with you, but he told Amy. I was like, BTEC, tell, tell Amy. Because in between the time that y'all left and Amy came, we had Papa Y from Congo come. Mm. And, uh, you know, he said how it started with a vision for him. The year BTEC and I were born, 1987, uh, he had a vision in Congo, which made him go to nursing school, which made him go live with. Uh, he, he met the, the, the Mabuti Pygmy people and had such a heart for him that he went to live among them as a nurse. Then that year, he decided to go get a PhD um, from a university in Australia in community development, international community development. 
So then he, then he became the Dean of the school of community development at a big university. And then all his students, especially if they were going to graduate with a master's degree, they had to go live with the pygmy people and make an actual difference to get their degree. They had wow. to show some sort of positive change made among them. So then they didn't have the resources. Then we got to come in as Fight for the Forgotten and partner with them and give those resources. So he, he talked about how it started with a vision and a vision brought me to him. Then BTEC told us how he was on that land in Karambi. And he was like, did until it was their decision he was wondering if we wasted these resources. Did I, did I, did I have them buy this land for no reason? Fight for the forgotten. Am I going to be in trouble? I mean, so um, you've got land are, here, right? The, and like these houses are getting built and they're not sure if the pygmy people are going to want to move there. There was, there were, they were verbally committed, but until they actually make that move until they make it theirs, you're like kind of wondering, you know, like if they'll just and stay so, in Booney, Missouri in the slums. Well, yeah, because because the people around them are their oppressors who use them, who for some of the people pay them in alcohol because they don't See, pay I, them. And any because money. we didn't get to witness any of that, it's such a tough connection for me to like put reality to it. Yeah, yeah. So I know those people, and they're not happy. Uh, well, I mean they they they've benefited by we've we have drilled some water wells in that area to to, to give them access to clean water, um, which was kind of like a olive branch you know like our, our you know we're here for you too and and it's true we are but um but we needed to get people safe <laughs> and so um until the batwa the king and his people they they beat that called one day at first he was like kind of concerned because he heard before he went out there uh, he was in karambi and he's going back to Masoli and he's like they broke all the houses they destroyed their homes and so, um, so then he gets there and King Zito, who you met and Otu, his, his son, the prince, yeah. they're like, all right, we're packed up. We're ready to go. <laughs> and, um, and so it was like this burning the boats moment, like no looking back, we're ready. And so how early then, was this in consideration for B tech to start loading people up? Was he ready for people or was he like, Oh, Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he was ready. He, but, but it, it expedited it. He was yeah. like hoping and all that. So, um, once they heard the water was set, uh, the latrines were there, the, the beds have come in. Are you guys ready to go? And then it took like a week or two for them to like, you know, have the, the community conversations around the, the, the fire and say that this is what we're doing. You know, it's a big move for 150 people. That's a it's lot like of a, people. It's not a family saying, oh, hey, we got a new job. Let's move across town. Um, it's it's like, hey, we're moving to a new district, but we're going to look over our ancestral home, the rainforest. We're going to be closer. We're going to have health care, um, all this stuff, because we have a nurse that, that works up there with them. And um, so, yeah, it's been – it was cool because BTEC said he was standing on that land and he was crying about a week or two before they moved. And he was – thinking, uh, what if this doesn't happen? You know, what if this doesn't happen and we've done all this? What are we going to do? Are we going to sell the land? Are we going to sell the homes to people? Are we going to rent them out? Like, what's going to happen? And then a week or two later, he gets a call saying, hey, let's go, <laughs> you know, or hey, come to us. We got something to show you. And then he gets calls from the neighbors of like, what are they doing? They're destroying their homes. Or like, uh, it was someone from the district. Was he experiencing resistance at all? He wasn't experiencing resistance. He was experiencing doubt. Got it. Um, and I don't know that there was really doubt spoken by the Batwa. It's good questions for me to go ask. Um, but him telling the story and sharing it with Zoe, sharing it with uh, Papa Y, sharing it with uh, Amy. It was like, so he was crying. But then right after that, he said he saw a vision of like the home's like his eyes were closed, but he's seeing like just light beaming from him. Like this is a city on a hill. This is a place of hope, a town of hope. It's going to happen. And he could, he could kind of foresee the hospital being built exactly on the land that we're trying to acquire now and the school over there. And like, this is going to be a project that people believe in and talk about and others are going to be inspired. And, and this is, this is going to happen. 
And so, and it has happened and it's going to continue to grow. So anyways, we're, I think we're all fired up. I'm fired up. Um, and I think now it's just leaning into other ways to support. That's, that's, what's weird about doing the mission statement is we can't list all the stuff we do. Sure. Of course. Um, yeah. It's too, it's, it's too like, messy for yeah, the for way things need to have, right? have like a pretty yeah. punch. Like yeah. it's a bad elder. So I think it's, I think it's fight for the forgotten helps, uh, the, the, the pygmy people build better lives through clean water and other essential services because Africa's most oppressed and poor people deserve a fighting chance. Yeah, man. And it was, like, it was unbelievable for me to see the change that you've brought and the impact that you've made to those people and getting some taste of the hurdles you've overcome and not just from the hurdle of like, if I can get X amount of dollars to build this, but you're now dealing with, bureaucrats and trying to buy land you're having to deal with the local communities uh, outside of the box you're having to deal with digging wells and land surveys and all the other bullshit that comes down the pipe of dealing with local government i got to see a little bit of a taste of that but like how much opposition do you guys run into everywhere um it happens but luckily um happen every year it happens less and less i feel like I mean, if you, if, if, if you knew what it was like 10, 12 years ago, right, right. what it is now, like now it's like one, we're way more adapted to it. Like we just don't pay bribes. We just don't do you it. know the game. Um, yeah. And we just don't do it because if we do it once, we're gonna have to do it all the time. And, and for um, those people listening, um, please don't imagine that these bureaucrats and government people are living fat off the land. Like we're used to with our yeah. bureaucrats. Yeah. They're also just as broke having yeah. jobs working in buildings without air conditioning yeah, without well, lights in most of the rooms. For instance, why, why it's so important for us to have uh, our own private, but publicly supported uh, hospital in partnership with the local um, politician or the local government, you know, is because, um, you know, Joffrey told me a story of how one of them got sick um, and was in an accident and they took him to the local clinic, which is the two and a half hour walk, but they drove him there and the hospital didn't have anything. The public hospital had nothing. Just doesn't have even them. supplies to help. Didn't have supplies or medicine. So they sent him four to six hours away. Basically Queen El it's in between Bwindi where you've been and Karambi. Like that's a 10 hour drive. So it was right. In the yeah. Middle. So a 10 hour drive on. Hours. Dirt roads. Dirt roads. Yeah. So they get there and they're sending Joffrey while they're trying to work one of the Batwa men who's dying. Um, they're sending him across town to go buy supplies and buy medicine because they don't have it there either. And so he's being, he's rushing across town and, and he ended up dying. And so um, it's like, man, that's, that's so rough. if this is it's a private facility, sure. you guys will be able to handle supplies and everything else. Yeah. And luckily, you know that we have had uh, Steve Kellerman's help who started a hospital, which was Scott. one of the top. Scott. Yeah. One of the top voted. Um, what did I say? Did I say Steve. Scott? I said Steve. His brother, Steve. Oh my gosh. His brother, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. He's no, down. I know it's Scott. Too. <laughs> I don't know why I said Steve. Steve and Scott. Uh, oh, I, actually, I just got a text from Steve. <laughs> so that's why I did it. Um but the uh, the Scott started a hospital twenty years ago that's voted one of the top, I think, one of the top three hospitals in East Africa. Now, wildly so, impressive to see what he's built there, dude. It's wild. It's in the jungle, <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, I think it was after you left that um, they operated on an American guy uh, that wanted to be evac'd out of there because he's like, I'm not having surgery here. Um, he's like, Well, your appendix isn't just sick it's bursted like we we got to do it and so uh the guy ended up donating afterwards uh what he would have had to pay for the evac um to the hospital and so anyway scott on the trip uh with papa Wai, he's like hey we're partners like we're gonna help you do this and we're gonna help you do it right and um dude that's you know, so great because having someone yeah. that knows how to run a hospital is such a different skill yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean again let's be honest again right? when like, i'm when i'm, when I'm talking <laughs> yeah <laughs> Whenever I'm talking about it before I know Scott, it's like, and have his full support and partnership, it's like, what am I getting myself into? Yeah, what am I getting the organization into? Um, but now it's like, 
We have a $1.5 million donation from the number one medical supplies nonprofit in the world. They were our first donors. Um, so before I got my round trip ticket paid, I talked to one guy who was the founder of Project Cure and he gave me a $3,000 check personally. Like, hey, we're investing in this. We believe in you. So I've waited 12 years uh, to ask them for support um, since then. I mean, we've, they've mentored me and they've been friends, but now it's like, hey, we're going to we're gonna do this together. We're doing it. So, yeah. And now we have boots on the ground that can help us do it. They can send nurses up to us that have graduated from, you didn't even see the university. I got to take Papa no. Y to the university and oh my gosh, they have hundreds of nursing students. Um, and they said, Hey, we'll just send some of our graduates up there to, to intern and get their so, first. Year so how does that work for the Batwa people, right? Like if they want to attend university or any of that, like how did, did they afford it? So we do, uh, we'll, we'll scholarship it. Okay. Um, and, and Scott said he would just take them, but we would help with like their living, um, expenses. And so what we can do is send some of the Batwa people down there to become nurses and they'll be there for 18 to 24 months and come back uh, to come back home and, and have a and job. And be able to work at the, the new hospital or clinic. Yep. Yep. Oh man. So we'll have staff housing. I was talking to Zoe about that today, right behind the clinic. We're going to have two, at least two staff houses that can room one to two people each, um, maybe more. And so we're in the planning stage of that and Yeah. It'll cost about 1.25 million, we think, um, to build the structures, but that's uh, a block of like three buildings for the medical clinic, plus the two staff houses, plus a three block of the school. So it's got like basic elementary, middle, high school, and then behind that, two staff houses. And then in between those, we're going to have some space so that if there's someone that's kind of inpatient or in delivery, they're not hearing all the kids play. Um, so it'll be like space in between it. That will be the gathering place and like training space and like cultural heritage space. Um, that's just like one big overhang, uh, where we can set up chairs or, uh, benches and we can do like the wash program, water and sanitation and hygiene. We can do peaceful coexistence or conflict resolution training. We can do leadership training. We can do all sorts of stuff there. It's a gathering place. So how many like different Batwa groups have you worked with? Cause I, I got to know these guys, but that's it. Yeah. So that's a good question. Really in Uganda one. Okay. Um, in, in Scott's people that we met and we're going right. to start working with them too. Um, so two. And then, uh, but among the Mabuti pygmy people a lot um, in Congo. So um, the thing is, is that, so of these people that, you know, um, their people group, um, the amazing Batwa in kind of Bunabujio district, they were the most in need that I had ever seen mm. because of the dire, desperate circumstances. And you felt that was a lot worse than say the people that you lived, <clears throat> that you were actually living with in the forest. Yeah. Cause they're the forest people. So living in the forest is a lot easier they like for it. them. They yeah. Know, right. 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 Yeah. They like it. I know it's, it's it. so tough for me to think that that's the preferred way to live no, that's, right that's compared the to the houses if, there's so much i can't unwire from just western well, living yeah amy amy saw it with um one of the batwa there that he just wants to be back in the forest um really so one of the just, guys in karambi actually he's out he's he's one that's outside and so okay. there's there's one guy that's kind of i wouldn't say resisted but i would say um is being used by still, still allowing himself to be used by the oppressors. Yeah. Um, and he is wounded. He's hurt. He's mad. He's angry. Um, and rightfully so, but you know, he's planning on moving up to Karambi, which is awesome. Uh, he's just drug his feet a little bit. He's the one guy. Um, but when we went on a tour of the forest of where they used to live, he was just so angry at the Ugandan wildlife authority. Um, and saying, we should be here. This is where we should be. And like basically raising his voice and not being nice and talking bad about him. And, <clears throat> and I get it. I get, I get it, it too, man. Just, Fuck you. People. Just not, yeah. There's just not that option. No, um, it's not. It's not a reality. It's not a reality. So he's kind of having to come to that realization on his own, own time. It's like, Hey man, we've, we've been trying and you've been trying and it's just, this, this is the option and this is the best option. Like if you want to be part of that, like, come on, we've got a, we've literally have a home for you. It's where you stayed. 
That would actually be oh, his right home. on. Yeah. <laughs> so the house you were in will be his home. Um, and uh, yeah, but the, I guess the reason I forget why I even shared that, except for, um, you know, there's, there's opportunities now and it's like, how can we build on those opportunities of like, you got to see some of the business loans being given out and people are actually taking action on them. And the rains came since, since you were there. And oh, so they're out snap. There, they're out there planting. Yeah. So oh, man, are waking I, up and hearing people farming. I, I, I can't wait to go back, man. I can't, I yeah. can't wait to go back and follow up and, and get more content for you guys and, and be part of it. Um, Dude, I, I had some of the more overwhelming moments of my life that I've ever had. Uh, you know, the first, we, we went and did the water celebration when we turned yeah. over the well to the local people in the area. Uh, we met Michael and, and got to be part of that. Um, seeing all those people there and like really whose life this very simple thing has changed. Yeah. And then add in the water walk and the knowledge of that ass kicker that we did. Um, yeah. Well, we got I mean, back, yeah, right? I would and love like, to hear your, your experience and perspective since, you know, we're really, really catching up and sharing it now, but yeah. Yeah. Thinking about just to set it up for that specific community, which are the neighbors of the Batwa, it's over 300 households that didn't have access. To it's a thousand people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yep. It's unbelievable, man. Um, and then we got back, right? And like, so that was the water celebration and we, and, and a lot of the Batwa came uh, and then they celebrated the rest of the night. They danced and partied yeah. and. Till the sun so, came up. <laughs> for me, right? Like we, we got to see some dancing and everything when we were down with Scott and Wendy, but it felt part of the tour to me. Yeah. And I don't mean that in any derogatory way. Like sure. I guess I have this weird filter, right? Of like, is this a Disney ride or is this a real thing that's happening? Yeah. And you know, you know what I mean between the two? Yeah. yeah. Um, the dancing and everything there felt very much like a Disney ride. Yeah. And then laying in my bed and just <laughs> hearing that community of 160 people dance and party through the night with some terrible Bluetooth speaker plugged in <laughs> and everyone getting after it. Um, and you came by to, to get me up to go dance and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't, man. I was laying in bed just listening to it and, and being in it and realized how fortunate I am, how lucky I've been. And the fact that these people have this brilliant, vibrant community and they're so packed with love with no resources that we've, we've missed the point somewhere Yeah, and seeing that thing operate. Um, I, I couldn't bring myself to go dance because I feel that as soon as I would have interjected myself, it changes it in some way. Cause right now their memory of that night doesn't involve me coming down to dance and film it. <laughs> it's just True. them celebrating. Yeah. And so just being a fly on the wall to watch that, like that's not a Disney ride that yeah. wasn't done for me in any way, shape or form. It was just me bearing witness to it and holding space. Yeah. And so Man, seeing that and just realizing that amount of love exists with so little resources that we've lost a big point. Like there's so yeah. much to learn here from these people that we just don't have in our community and society anymore. So that, that night was really big, man. Cause in a tight knit group like that of 160 people, like everyone still has purpose. Now they're not chasing some global dream of purpose, right? Of like, I want to be Elon Musk or shoot rockets into space. But everyone's got purpose every day of they need water, they need food, they need, they have things to do. Yeah. And so by the end of the day, like everyone's valuable, everyone's contributing. Oh, yeah. And so is there that sense of worth that we've missed a lot of with more modern society? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you're speaking to something that I have had the more opportunity to pick up on and read just because of the time I've gotten to spend with them. But no, you're right. Every person has a purpose because every person is needed, welcomed, wanted, depended on. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone has a role that actually they play. And so um, I, I've had moments where uh, 
you know, I've only seen it once, but someone kind of getting disciplined, you know, but needed to because um, their drinking was really getting out of hand. And yeah, it was the only thing they were getting paid, paid in, but then they assaulted the slave masters uh, tribe. And then from there, it got out of hand again. And they're bringing them to the center of the village. And like the elders, their wives are talking with this man, hey, you can't do this anymore. You can't, you got to stop. And it happens again. I don't know I'm going with this story because it's not a great ending, but it happened again. And um, when that happened, he was about to bring on suffering or pain or more hardship to the entire community, not just himself. And so that's the only time I've seen someone actually banished from the tribe. Wow. But, um, you know, he probably anger, trauma, addiction, all this stuff acted out and hit someone over the head with a, um, uh, not a two by four, but like a big log basically. Yeah. And really hurt that person. So they're like, no, you can't you be go. here. You got to go. But in other ways, I've seen like people that are having a marital dispute. Well, that's not hidden. You hear that, um, yeah, especially yeah. when you're still in the twig and leaf huts. Um, well, they bring them to the center of the village and around the fire and they ask, how can we help? What's going on? You know, and, and they talk it out and they get feedback. And, um, and, and so there's, there's like support numbers, if that makes sense, where it's like, For hey, sure we're, not gonna, right? like we're not going to let this continue. How do we address this? Well, one of the um, things I've got to see lucky enough traveling as much as I have, right, is like whether that's the people in Iceland, which are, you know, you've got 300,000 people on an island. They're, they're still somewhat isolated and there's not yeah. the anonymity that we have living in big cities here. Yeah. And so there is more of a sense of community. Yeah. Well, even the sense of community, those long, long water walks. Um, right. They, you're not distracted on your phone because shit doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they rarely do them alone. I would assume they're You're not doing, talking either because water walks are fucking hard. <clears throat> they're hard. But Dude. I think when they used to it, they talk, they bond. Um, yeah, I got spend trashed time together. By that. Dude, it was, it was one let, of the let me it catch, harder. Yeah, why don't you, I'll let you explain the water walk that we did. Uh, well, I'll give my perspective and you add color because um, this wasn't my first rodeo. Um, I had done at least 12, probably 15. It's just the them. worst one you've ever done. Without a shadow of a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, the hardest one I've done. So I've done the two top 14ers in Colorado. Uh, I did one in a snowstorm um, in the winter getting ready for Kilimanjaro. Um, I did Mount Kilimanjaro with NFL veterans and military veterans. Um, and we started that summit day at midnight and we finished at 8.30 p.m. So that's a day. Uh, I forget how many hours it is. But it's like it's 20 hours. Cause I did, yeah, I did hours. my bike ride from midnight till nine 30 PM. And that's 21. That's the only reason I have yep. a reference. Yeah. So this was like 20 and a half hours. And so, uh, when I got done with that, i lost a lot of weight. Um, you know, I think I lost 15, 20 pounds in those eight days. Um, maybe I lost 12 to 15 something, but this was different because this was high, high, high intensity um, for the and entire hot. time and hot. And I, and I we didn't I have got water because we're idiots. Yeah. I think Brant had his camel back, but it wasn't full. Right. Yeah, he and didn't have the, his full. I had just this guy. Yeah. For, it was that exact one for four and a half hours is what it took us to do it. Yeah. And I had a, a one and a half liter bottle of water that I finished by water point three, I think. We're yeah. like um, almost finished. So the, we were roasting in the sun and I thought I was going to get a like heat stroke. Yeah. My heart rate wouldn't stop. It, it wouldn't calm down. Brant commented to me about it um, afterwards. Brant's seen me do now some gnarly physical stuff, you know, between the, the motorcycle trips and me doing yeah. the bike ride and me doing other stuff. And he's like, I've never seen you struggle. Yeah. And like, I didn't have any nice things to say anymore by like, <laughs> well, as soon as we had the jerry cans full, like, I'm like, we're not capable of getting these back. Like, yeah. We're not going to be able to carry both of these. Uh, like, no maybe it was away. my child, my, that childlike thing you say. But Dude, I was, I was like, nervous about it from the moment you brought it up to me of like, 
we're going to carry two jerry cans each. And I'm like, oh, man, an 80-pound well, farmer carry for a mile is a long way. It, if 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 water point one or two or three had water, and three did, but it was like stagnant and gross and mosquitoes and all yeah, that stuff. Yeah, ain't water. If we, yeah, yeah. if we just had to walk down, we would have done it. You're fucking crazy. We, we could have done the no down. No way. You mean by all the beehives? We would have scaled down <laughs> that, were, that, that That were killer bees. That were oh, killer bees. Oh, God, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah so- well, it would have been much more dangerous, but the weight, we could have carried it down or flat. But going up was impossible. Going up was impossible. Yeah. I was doing everything I could. Like, I would fashioned my shirt into a yoke across my shoulders, and I just, just couldn't. I, yeah. I just carried as Going far as I was could. Impossible. And then oh, everyone, and then Michael, was in a struggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even Michael Joffrey pulled a rib. Did you know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good for him. <laughs> <laughs> good for him making fun of the Mazungas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but Joffrey was the one that um, hurt us temporarily, but saved us in the long run because he was like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, you can't drink that water at water point four, which I was so thirsty. I was willing to drink it because it was coming from Boy, a what a weird thing to, to really have go through. Cause I thought the same. I was like, but well, we just got water. Like I could at least refill here. Right. And he's like, Nope. I'm like sick. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we can drink this. I've drank some of the, some gnarly stuff. I love that and, you're ready. Uh, you're like, Oh, I've had malaria four times. This water is <laughs> worth the risk. Yeah. Um, uh, but whatever, I think, I don't know if he told you, but after, uh, a while I was like, how bad was that water? He goes, Oh, it was one of the sickest times I've ever been drinking water. And really? that, from a guy that, yeah, from a that guy lives that, that lives there that has drank some gnarly water. He was like, no, I wasn't, I wasn't going to let that happen to y'all. All right. Yeah. Good so to know. Right Glad call. that yeah. wasn't the direction we went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And man, we, we fought it out and got out of there and got back to Michael's and was completely shot. Oh yeah. Yeah. Was that was completely throttled. That was worse. Uh, than any fight I've ever been in, uh, any endurance thing I've ever done, without a doubt. Yeah, it was a four and a half. I figured probably four and a half hours. I bet we covered five. between five and six miles and oh, probably yeah. 2,000 plus feet of elevation. On yeah, not like so, hard packed trail. No, no, on like dirt. Jagged rock. Yeah. Dirt. Yeah. So it was um, driving down, we clocked it, driving down the mountain was uh, more than six kilometers. It okay. was like six and a half or something. <laughs> so, so we at least did that. Um, yeah. So at least four miles. Yeah. Well, that was just down. So down and back is six and six kilometers, whatever 12 gross kilometers is. Yeah. yeah. 10 kilometers is like 6.2 miles. Yeah. So we so, did a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it was an experience and, 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 and for, and for Michael to tell us besides, besides water point three, which the women and children wouldn't go to, um, just because of the danger of the cliffs and the killer bees, um, and, and walking down and falling, he was like, yeah, you know, my wife and child does this more right. than me, unless it, unless it's dry season and they have to do it at night. I couldn't, then, then it's him. I, I couldn't ever get out of my head right that like the reality is that michael's well in his mid-20s 26 and has 26 right like is college educated he's living in this mud brick hut and he's been doing this water walk essentially since the age he's been able to help yep so three to five let's say probably closer to the three yep um the fact that he bothered to do it with us <laughs> i just again. couldn't help but realize that like man if i've done that walk at least once a day for 23 <laughs> years of my life and like i know every twig on that route and two big white guys show up with a camera crew and they're like hey would you like to take us on that terrible water walk you've done every day of your life for the last 23 years up until two weeks ago i'd have been like nah man it's that way <laughs> yeah best exactly. of luck yeah, See you guys when you get back. <laughs> I'm gonna be yeah. chilling. <laughs> yeah. So it's cool. Vivian Vivian got to take Amy on that walk. Not okay. the full thing. Sure. But to water point one and two and two point five. Not point. all the way back down to uh no Rimabaldi where we four. got the water. No, no. So and she didn't go to point three either. But uh 
but she just did the short, short route. And sure. Just like, I can't believe women and children do this. Like how? And, um, just like we had, how, how does anyone do this? Um, it's dangerous. Now, how, and, um, like, so now it's, they don't change the gears a little bit, right? Like seeing again, it, it, people won't get the scale because you're not there. Um, this 50 acres that you guys not just provided in Karambi, but have added infrastructure to you've not only added what 30 homes and different options for running water on the side of the mountain to different pickups, you know, through, through the town, I guess is what you would call it through city, uh, yeah. through their community, whatever it is. Um, yeah. To understand that like that road to get there doesn't exist. Those houses don't exist. These people don't have homes. That running water doesn't exist. The shed that we're sitting in where there's some light and the TV that plays nonstop Kung Fu movies <laughs> isn't there. Like none of that exists without you having the balls some 12 years ago to want to go to the Congo. You know, that's a crazy overwhelming thing to think about following a purpose and a vision that you didn't have an answer for other than just effort. How is that looking at it from that perspective? I'm, I'm fucking blown away by the amount of stuff you guys got done or are doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess being in it, you don't really have, I guess, I, I guess you're helping me take the time and you did while we were there too. And that's why I got teary eyed was like looking back at, all the stuff it's taken to get there. Um, but no, uh, you, you didn't get to meet Fred, but, but Fred we're engaging with now even more. He was the excavator with the, with the grader and the bulldozer and okay. all that stuff. And he, he, he loves it. And we're engaging with him more to be part of our team. We took him Joffrey and Cosmos on their first ever airplane ride. Holy um, shit. <laughs> yeah. They were grabbing the front seat and they're going, Oh my God. Oh my God. And like really? laughing, but they're, they said their stomachs were in their throats and heart, heart in their mouth. And, um, and it was just a blast, uh, for us to take them because we had to have a meeting and we needed, they needed to go get more supplies in, uh, in, in the capital city. So we took them from Fort Portal there and it was just a blast. But <clears throat> to see Fred go, wow. You know, I didn't know how we were going to get a road there, but we got it. We did it. It exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thinking and, and of, thinking about how we've made more than 10 kilometers of road in the mountains near the rainforest where like that supplies just isn't That there, road alone is more impact than I've ever been able to instill back on earth. You know yeah. what I mean? And I want to, like I'm trying <laughs> and the fact that that road by itself, not to mention the homes and shelter and everything else, um, blown yeah. away, man. I mean, I've, I've heard your story so many times and you and I have been close friends for the last couple of years, but you know, without the experience, I don't have the, the perspective of realizing what you've done. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess it's, um, yeah, I guess it's mind blowing to me personally. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've better. And, and there's man. more. There's more. And we're talking about uh, up there by those two big rocks. There's actually another spot that's super, super flat that I don't know that we got you to. Uh, getting another five acres and maybe putting like a guest house. Uh, Is this where homes. the the church was going to be? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So get getting that land so we can. Um, you know, have a view of the river and have a view of the town or community and uh, have a, it be a little bit away for, you know, if we have some medical missions, people come in that are going to, you know, do some surgeries or um, do some eye care, dental work or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and agronomist or agriculturalist that can help with the farms. Um, it's like, holy smokes, we can, it's like, once we talk, like before we were talking about, it, it's like, can this be done? Now it's like, oh, we've done it. We can do it again. And we're going to, and it's going to grow and it's going to get bigger. And it's going to, I mean, it can sound super silly, 
But um, yeah, I was I was talking with Zoe. I'm like, what do you think about a gondola to where <laughs> we can we can hike so supply get supplies up there where the instead of putting load on our truck, um, you know, put people on it and they can get up and down sure. the mountain easier. Um, and it's just like we can have fun with it. Yeah, where it's like uh, where it's like what other solutions can we think of? You were with Bernard and he gets out on top of that mountain. He's like. Solar, the sun's here, but wind, wind turbines. Wind first turbine. five seconds. Uh, it wasn't five minutes, was it? It was like first five, no, it's seconds. immediately the first thing he said. <laughs> immediately the first so, thing he said. And that yeah, got rules, man. Yeah, having the founder of Engineers Without Borders, who has sent it's part of the team, right? Something like 17,000 engineers to like 30, 40 countries around the world or more. Um, you know, having this A team, like literally the dream team. If I could it's- assemble the people you know, pick, pick of the litter or whatever. It's like, this is it. You know, and as kind of, you know, I know we're closing in on time for you. Um, I guess, you know, the big question for people who want to support, do any of those things, like how does yeah. this become self-sustainable for them so that it isn't always just in having to come take care of it? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, we're, we're starting to think about that with education of, not just a school for the kids, but a school, like a vocational school, a polytechnic school of like how they can take care, really truly learn to take care of themselves to where there's the local economy. So they're already putting their heads together saying, we need at least a once a month market, but we would like a once every weekend market. Um, and then they'll, they're, they've, they've already gone from one little shanty or whatever you call it, shack, to now five uh, at this city center up there in the mountains well, now there's, they're wanting to have barbers. They're wanting to have like uh, welders. They're wanting to have like a bike mechanic uh, and a motorcycle mechanic and all this stuff. So we continue to support them so they can support themselves and have these creative ideas to where once there's resources, they can start to flourish and start to build and start to grow and start to invest and all these things. So our, our greatest way to have support now is finding monthly donors, people that will join our fight club, our monthly giving club. That is like, you know, I can give $5 a month. I can give $25 a month. Sorry, you, know, you, you cut, you cut for a second. I'm not sure we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as, as we wrap, it's like um, people, if they want to support, it's they can join our monthly giving club that supports us supporting them, supporting themselves. Mm-hmm. And so it can be $5 a month. It can be $25 a month. Be, some people give $500 a month, which is incredible. So um, if people want to support, that's the best way at fightfortheforgotten.org. They can mm-hmm. go there, give, and then it gives you an option to give one time or to give monthly. And if people can give monthly, even if it's a lesser amount, like, please, that, that's that's awesome because that no, Seriously, us, every, every dollar makes a big difference there. Like, I know it really that's does. cheesy to say, but a dollar... You know, you not having one coffee a month helps. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really does. And we know, you know, I, I do. know the people that. It's yeah, it changed my perspective on all that completely. Yeah. yeah. And so it's not always like guys, that, but with this, it is. Yeah. And one of the reasons I love Fight for the Forgotten so much, and I'm drawn to it and called to help in any way we can too, right? Was seeing that these people don't want to just be taken care of. They want yeah to build their own community. They just yeah. don't have resources. And that's a really hard thing with as much as Western culture is built on this, pull yourself up by your shoelaces yeah. thing and yeah. everything it's else. It's not like, a laziness thing. Nope. It's an opportunity. It's thing. an opportunity there. And, and seeing, so that's what we try to say. It's, it's not just charity. We're providing opportunity and it's not a handout. It's a hand up. It's and that's real, man. Seeing you guys it's offer like the small real. business loan and see people be able to start really producing for themselves. Um, and and seeing that like the small business loan, right? Like we're still talking about a hundred dollars cash, but it's put in paper that you owe me this money back so that we can invest yeah. it again to the next person in the community that needs it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's fun. It's great. It's uh, it's going to continue to grow and build. And then the ultimate goal is once we have this as not just a blueprint cookie cutter solution, but like, once we've worked out the kinks, once we've proven the, or we have proof of concept, now we can go replicate in mm-hmm. other areas where we know how to develop this. We have a system and process. We find the local stakeholders. We find the the kind of peacekeepers or, or the, the passionate people that are going to advocate for it and say they believe in it. 
And then we can say, hey, we can start small here. And as it grows, we can grow it into this and this. This is phase one. This is phase, we're already on phase two. How do we get to phase three, four, five? And how does this become a self-sustaining community with sustainable solutions and, and community development opportunities to where then they can take it and run with it because they own it. It's theirs. Right. And that, again, you guys hand it over the 50 acres to the people. We got yep. to be there for that celebration. That's not yeah. fight for the forgotten Justin's land that you're letting people yep. live on. It's theirs. Yeah. And it has to be. And, and they'll never be kicked out again. What, yeah. yeah, exactly. Because it's supported one, it's theirs, um, but it's supported by the local state, national government. And there's all these signatures and all these players and all these lawyers and all these people that, 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 that know how, how it's uh, to be self-sustaining. So, yeah, man, I love you, bro. Dude, I love, I love you, you too, Thank man. You for having me um, on. Let's do more of this. Like, yeah, we could just catch up more. again another time and do another podcast. Yeah, uh, I love you, man. I mean, I love you too. We got to cover some ten thousand foot view of that trip, and, yeah. and I want to dive more into details. More. But yeah, I would love let's, that. So let's do this the regular. Last thing I'll say. Let's do it regular. Last thing I'll say is that people could support another project of another podcast, but it's the Karma Project dot life. www.thekarmaproject.life and if you're a one-time donor, you can go give there and you can also subscribe or, or join the monthly giving club right from that. And it'll just help us boost to our, 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 our next goal. And that'll be for the school and hospital. Yep. It's specifically for that in the water reservoir. So we got the water yeah. reservoir drilled. We oh, just have right. to build, build it. We just have to yep. get the huge tank and distribute it through the mountain community. Well, brother, I appreciate your time and everything. And I can't wait to see you again. Yeah. Yeah, I love, love you, man. You, bro.